All right, it's 10 o'clock Central Time. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, Central Region Offices. Uh, let me start by just saying thank you for participating in today's webinar titled Forecasting in the Forecast Builder Era. Uh, the webinar will be led by Andy Boxel and John Gagan. As many of you likely know, Andy is a forecaster at our Springfield office and John is the Sioux at Milwaukee. Before we get started, um, just lay the groundwork here a little bit. Uh, of course, the majority of Central Region has been using Forecast Builder since October, and that's when our Central Region Forecast Builder demonstration began. So most all of you should be very familiar with the basic concept and the process involved. Since the demonstration began along the way, our Central Region Grid Methodology team and the Consistency team uh, have been doing their best to, to answer questions along the way and to maintain open communication. And as you may recall, there's been several webinars uh, during the fall and winter to keep everyone up to date and to assist with uh, this transition. And it hasn't been without a few bumps along the way, but everyone's done their absolute best to keep this moving forward. So let me you know, extend a thank you to everyone uh, involved as far as the, the teams involved, but also a, a word of thanks to all the forecasters within the demonstration who uh, have provided and really continue to provide feedback uh, about how well the demonstration is going and areas for possible improvement. So as Andy and John will begin to de uh, describe here in more detail shortly, the main focus of this webinar is really twofold. First, it's to reaffirm the role of the forecaster in the forecast process, and, and you see that on the title slide. And that's a very important role, and that point will come across loud and clear. Uh, and the second uh, focus of the webinar is to begin to describe and introduce the, the concept of a target of opportunity. Uh, basically, we're asking ourselves, when and where are we making the best use of our time as humans within the forecast process, and how do we start to do this in more of a coordinated fashion? And this will really be important, of course, as we move toward the fully integrated field structure. So uh, with that background, I'll pass it over to Andy and John here momentarily. Uh, let me uh, point out that the webinar is being recorded, so it'll be available to anybody that uh, can't make today's webinar. And remind you also that there'll be an opportunity for any questions and answers uh, questions to answer at the end of the webinar. So you can hold those to the end and uh, we'd like to field as many questions as all of you may have. So with that background, I'll pass it over to Andy and John. It's all yours. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, as Bruce alluded to, um, this presentation came about because uh, the Central Region Grid Team and Central Region Consistency Team uh, really started to see that it would be quite helpful to develop uh, a consistent and effective uh, process for uh, forecasters to approach the forecast process now that we're in the forecaster builder era um, as we started last fall with the with the demonstration At the same time we also felt that it was really important for us to reaffirm the role that each of us as forecasters has uh, in that process. So uh, as we get started here, before we begin, I do want to also extend my thanks on behalf of both uh, the grid team and the consistency team uh, to a whole host of individuals, far too many to name, who have uh, shared in this effort, in this presentation, uh, our sincere thanks to, uh, to everyone who has provided feedback so far uh, or otherwise shared input. Okay, so as we begin, uh, I think it's really helpful for us to take a look back at how GFE has evolved since it was first fielded back in the early 2000s. Uh, early on, as many of you likely recall, there really was not a lot in the way of gridded data that was even available in GFE, and what was available was really had pretty lackluster quality, uh, and the resolution was very coarse. On top of that, you know, the number and the quality of smart tools that we had available was really low, and that left forecasters uh, with little recourse but to spend a lot of time hand jamming data into GFE. And what this did, it essentially it turned forecasters into database managers. Uh, hours were spent on a given shift manipulating grids, and that was all with the goal of just getting reasonable text output for what at the time was the Weather Service's flagship product, uh, the ZFP. Unfortunately, when we turned forecasters into database managers, I think that resulted in many of us beginning to equate database managing with forecasting. And that created a situation where mouse clicks and using the pencil tool for a few hours after, uh, every afternoon really started to replace the science of meteorology. 
So here at the very beginning, I want to offer up a couple of definitions to really make clear the difference between forecasting and grid editing. Uh, we'll define, uh, for the purposes of this webinar, uh, weather analysis and forecasting as assessing the current state of the atmosphere by interrogating observed and remote sensing data and quantifying its future evolution by interpreting model output and statistical intelligence and applying conceptual models. On the other hand, grid editing is simply a collaborative digital forecast database management of specific meteorological variables. I think I can probably safely speak for most forecasters uh, across the Weather Service that uh, we didn't go through several uh, semesters of differential equations and calculus uh, to be database managers. We wanted to be forecasters. So I think it's really important that we break out those two definitions. As you know, you know today is really, really different. Um, this is an era where our users now require hour by hour resolution. They expect forecast impacts to be as accurate as possible down to that two and a half by two and a half kilometer grid point. Uh, their decisions, which are decisions that oftentimes have enormous economic or life safety impacts, depend on the quality of our IDSS messaging. Uh, and that, of course, is going to be directly informed by our forecasting skills. Uh, our greatest value as forecasters, it's not database management. It's our meteorological expertise, and it's the relationships that we build with our core partners. And then, most importantly, uh, it's our unique human ability to use that knowledge to communicate incredibly complex scientific information in a way that is understandable and relatable. I think it's also vital that we separate out database management from forecasting because the gridded database, NDFD, uh, is only really one very small part of our IDSS message and in so many ways it's a very uh, incomplete source of data. Uh, GFE and NDFD by their nature are deterministic. Uh, they are woefully incapable of capturing many of those details that we know are really important to our users. Uh, things like confidence, impacts, uh, probabilistic solutions, those low probability but very high impact alternative scenarios. Um, and not only is NDFD not capable of capturing these things, but as I said before, you're communicating such complex information in a way that's understandable and applicable and actionable, uh, that's precisely what we're best at as human forecasters. So my argument here is ultimately that if we see ourselves only as database managers, we're shortchanging our users but I think most importantly, we're shortchanging ourselves. Uh, as skilled expert meteorologists, I really do believe we are capable uh, of so much more than simply maintaining a GFE database. Now, to realize that value, uh, it is going to take a substantial change in our mindset and our approach uh, to fully leverage these skills and abilities, but I really think we owe it to ourselves uh, to undertake this change. Ultimately, in the end, our IDSS messaging has to be front and center. Uh, having the most statistically accurate ZFP is just not going to cut it anymore. Uh, instead, we need to be providing that continuously updated, consistent IDSS-centric message uh, that takes advantage of every forecast and communication tool and skill uh, that we have available to us. Here's, uh, starting on the next slide, John is going to present a step-by-step -step process for forecasters to follow as they approach forecasting uh, in the era of Forecast Builder. Uh, this is a process that we very strongly believe respects and promotes the science, uh, maximizes our value as human forecasters, uh, and all does all of that while setting us up to provide a consistent, continuously updated, impact-based message to our core partners. Before we begin, however, I want to provide a clear definition of the term target of opportunity. Uh, this is a term that's been thrown around a lot over the last several years, but I don't think has ever been really well defined. So I want to offer up that definition. Uh, and it's really a two-part definition. Part one, when and where the ongoing IDSS message and potential impacts need to be revised based on a sound scientific forecast approach and or those inherent biases in blended model guidance that have a significant impact on the overall forecast message. Uh, some examples, those meso or microscale effects, dampening or smearing effect of blended uh, QPF and the snow and ice output, or extreme pattern changes due to the reliance of bias corrected data in the blend. Uh, we're going to reference this several times in the upcoming steps, and then I will expand considerably on that definition and provide a number of examples uh, toward the end of the webinar. So, John. 
Thank you, Andy. And uh, as Andy mentioned, uh, I'm going to take you through uh, an eight-step process here. Uh, but before we get into that real quickly, I want everybody to take at least a moment to think about how they approach their day. Uh, when they're on a, a forecast desk, if you're on a day shift, if you're on an eve shift and a night shift, how do you approach that shift and, and how are you approaching uh, what needs to be done through your day? And think about that in relation to going through these steps. Now, some of these steps you may look and see, it's like, hey, that's not really all that new or different, and, and that's probably a good thing. But for others, I, I think it's going to be uh, a refreshing way of looking at this, something that makes logical sense, but it also uh, brings into a mix of, of man and technology. Where can technology serve the human forecaster the best, and how can that also allow the human forecaster to serve the customer the best? So as you begin to approach the forecast process on a given shift, uh, step one is to clearly establish what your office's IDSS message is currently focused on. So what is the message of the day? Uh, review the suite of the messaging that the office utilizes, and that can be through a variety of sources. You've got your AFD, you've got social media posts, Facebook, Twitter, so on. You've got top news stories, potentially. You've got your weather story, and then you have your gridded database and GFE and begin to focus your attention on those time ranges where the inherited forecast suggests that significant impacts are possible and or places where significant model variability is creating especially low confidence, uh, things that you're going to need to pay attention to. So as you begin the forecast process, these are the places that you should be especially mindful of. So that step one is aligning uh, your efforts at the, at the onset of your shift. Step two, and this is where the forecast process really begins. Uh, and this is the time to be assessing the current state of the atmosphere, using the full suite of tools, techniques, and knowledge available. And this should include an, an interrogation of observed data, including, including the use of model-derived analyses uh, as desired. This could be hand analysis, surface and upper, upper air observations. You know, some folks like to get their hands in it. Some people use a uh, computer to, to, help, to help them with that. However, it, it is to get yourself aligned with the current or recent state of the atmosphere. And you should also be taking advantage of the full suite of remote sensing data. Actually, you've got radar and now GO-16 satellite data, which has got a tremendous amount of information uh, to provide forecasters. As you then begin to get a full picture of the current state of the atmosphere, then we get, begin to calibrate that 3D conceptual model of the atmosphere with model initialization. So here's where we are now. You know, how is tonight, tomorrow, the next day going to be different than where we're at right now? And this is especially vital for the first 24 hours of the forecast period. So we get to step three. And this is where we start to take the 3D conceptual model that you've developed, and, and then we become a 4D model. How are we going to project this out in time? And in this step, forecasters should be reviewing uh, verification information, uh, ensemble output, deterministic model solutions, and other forecast intelligence that's available to us. Uh, for instance, uh, a lot of folks like to use the SIPS analogs as, a, as an example. Uh, so then we begin to apply that forecast funnel concept to develop forecast solutions. I want to pause here and, and make sure that I reiterate that steps two and three are really the heart of the forecast process. This is where forecasting is. And, and I want to note that beside checking the gridded database at the very beginning of the shift to gain situational awareness, none of this has yet to involve GFE in any way. We begin to finally get into the gridded database with step four, and this is really a two-parter. Uh, the first is to be updating through period two uh, at least every three hours and more is needed. And this ESTF period is the place more than anywhere else to have our short-term forecast skills really shine. And for period three through the end of day seven, Forecast Builder then runs at 5.30 and 17.30 UTC. Step five involves the quality control of the initialized database. And this is uh, to address any non-meteorological or spurious data. In addition, data should be QC'd for consistency among WFOs. You know, since we're all initializing from the same database at the same time, the data should be essentially identical. 
however, differences can crop up on occasion due to something arriving late. Uh, potentially there's some databases missing, some models missing, something comes in late uh, and doesn't get into the super blend initialization. If you're seeing significant differences with a neighbor on a regular basis, then we really implore you to reach out to your SUE, your ITO, and your grid team to see if there's a, a more uh, foundational problem that needs to be corrected. These people love to help. Uh, I've worked with the grid team for many years. Uh, these folks are as gung-ho as can be, and they want to help. They hate to hear when things aren't going well uh, for folks out in the field. So please, if they don't know, they can't help you. Make sure you utilize them. Now, as we tra transition to the national blend of models, time on this step is probably going to decrease because we're no longer running the initialization individually at 38 WFOs. We're not burning a lot of hamster hair on the old servers uh, 38 different ways. It's all now going to come from one source and then sent out uh, through the SBN to all of our offices. And I think we will see a, a decrease in problems uh, as it relates to 38 offices running the initialization individually. Step six now brings us to the point where edits to the initialized data may be uh, needed or desired. It's not practical nor a good use of time in most cases to make small changes all throughout the seven day forecast. Instead, our attention should be focused on those points where a message is especially impactful or important. Uh, if the initialized data differs in a meaningful way from your forecast expectations, then a target of opportunity may exist and changes could be warranted. And of course, it's critical that any edits to the initialized database be executed only after discussing and obtaining a consensus with your affected neighboring offices. And it should be noted that based on feedback and conversations with select forecasters across the, the Weather Service, that there are a lot of people who tend to begin their forecast pr uh, process at step four, at the initialization uh, uh, point. And then they're trying to cram in critical forecast steps like analysis and, and model interrogation and comparison into a much more compact, small period of time. And the end result here is that forecasters are quickly overwhelmed and strapped for time. And that preparation that we do prior uh, to the initialization is absolutely key to the, access, to the success of how we approach our day. So now we go on to step seven, and this involves collaboration, coordination with WPC or any of our other national centers on high impact events. And then you have uh, step eight, and this is where your office's message is then updated using the full suite of communication vehicles available to us, uh, with a particular emphasis on describing expected impacts, confidence, and uncertainty. And of course, this is not a one-time process, but a cycle of sorts that should play out on a continuous basis for the very short term. And then at least every few hours for the full uh, short-term ESTF period. And then uh, you know, six to 12 hours or so for the extended. Future data sets, including an increasing number of high spatial and temporal resolution model data, and the fire hose of data we're gonna get from GO16, and we're starting to see already, and more will come. This will require us to be continuously nudging the forecast towards the latest information as opposed to only revisiting a package every few hours. This is especially the case for the very short term where the availability of observations as well as model resolution and skill are at their greatest. All right, thanks, John. Um, keeping in mind that definition, the targets of opportunity that I shared earlier and is back up on your screen, um, I now want to go through a few examples of things that would qualify and some things that would not qualify uh, as targets of opportunity. Practically speaking in operations, uh, a target of opportunity and, and any potential edits to the gridded database are always going to meet three criteria. Uh, number one, the proposed change needs to make a meaningful difference to your office's IDSS message. Uh, often, though certainly not always, this is going to mean that the magnitude of the change is going to be fairly significant. Uh, so as an example, you know, here in Springfield, a change from 70 degrees to 72 degrees for high temperature on day three in September, that is not a meaningful change. Uh, that, that really has no effect whatsoever on our office's IDSS message. Now, that's not to say that a two degree change can be a, a significant target of opportunity. Uh, if you've got a situation where you're adjusting hourly temperatures from 31 uh, to 33 or vice versa and precipitation is expected, hey, that's probably going to be a meaningful difference to your office's IDSS message. Uh, 
along with making a meaningful difference in messaging, uh, part two uh, calls for changes to the initialized database needing to be limited to those instances where you have clear predictive skill to make that change. Uh, as we all know, predictive skill tends to decrease the further out in time uh, that one goes. So as an example, removing POPs in the short term based on radar trends and near-term model guidance definitely something you have predictive skill for and could be a valid target of opportunity. Uh, on the other hand, you know, taking out or reducing POPs by five or ten percentage points on day five or day six, we just don't have the, the predictive skill to be able to do something like that. And then part three, uh, these changes need to always be successfully collaborated with neighboring uh, WFOs and do it in a way that makes meteorological sense. Uh, in other words, uh, forecasters should not just be running the Smooth 100 tool or SERP ISC multiple times. Uh, as a forecaster who does this day in and day out, I can certainly attest that by working with your neighbors and using uh, the multitude of smart tools and model blends that we have available, uh, it is almost uh, always possible to get a, a output in the gridded database that is both consistent and meteorological in nature. So here are some examples of things that would qualify as targets of opportunity. Uh, certainly not an exhaustive list by any means, but just a few, uh, a few examples that we thought of. Uh, first one here, changes in surface temperature or other environmental inputs uh, that would have an impact on precipitation type. Uh, so not only temperature at the surface, but maybe max uh, wet bulb temperature aloft uh, using forecast builder and the top-down methodology, uh, probability of ice presence, something like that that would have uh, a considerable impact on precipitation type. Uh, a shift in the forecast uh, that affects the beginning or peak time or ending of a particular weather hazard that would uh, affect the impact uh, in your forecast area. So uh, as an example, a light snow that is now going to begin at 4 o'clock in the afternoon instead of 7 o'clock in the evening and thus would be affecting uh, the drive home from work and school. A strong or severe convection is always going to qualify as a target of opportunity, as would any impactful winter weather. And then we have those portions of the forecast where blended or ensemble guidance, by its very nature, is going to struggle. Uh, and this is all with the caveat that enough predictive skill uh, exists to nudge toward a particular solution and that those changes are, are meaningful uh, to the office's IDSS message. So uh, QPF, uh, we know that blended model guidance tends to smear out uh, and dampen uh, QPF maxima, uh, and we see that in both QPF as well as snow and ice. Uh, terrain effects, blended model guidance struggles at times in, in places of complex terrain. Uh, lake effect up in our Great Lakes offices, that's something that blended model guidance can struggle with at times. And every office has some local effects that uh, crop up from time to time that blended guidance might, uh, might struggle with. High wind events, especially for our, our offices in the mountains and the high plains, something that we know that blended model guidance, uh, both because of its struggles with terrain as well as the dampening of maxima, uh, tend, to, uh, tend to struggle with a bit. And then we have uh, significant pattern changes where the bias corrected database may have a little bit of a lag time and needs to catch up. It might be uh, best to go with a raw model output as opposed to the bias corrected output. Uh, something like a strong frontal passage or other boundary that comes through. You may not have that predictive skill several days out, but as you get closer in in time and you have high resolution model guidance available to you, you have observations available to you, uh, you can really begin to hone in on the timing and the differences along the gradient with that boundary. Definitely something that would be a target of opportunity. And then, of course, we do have some things that would not qualify as targets of opportunity. Uh, first and foremost, adjustments that don't have a significant impact on the forecast message. Uh, most often, this seems to occur with temperature, uh, where there's a desire to make a change of just a couple of degrees, uh, even when that adjustment is not going to make a significant difference to the office's IDSS messaging. Another common set of adjustments that don't qualify as targets of opportunity are going to be those that are beyond the realm of reasonable predictability. Uh, and in many cases, as I mentioned before, this is going to be tied to how far out in time the adjustment in question is. Uh, what may be predictable in period two is just not going to be predictable on day five. A uh, few examples of that that I commonly see, uh, forecasters trying to choose a winner between the GFS and the European at extended time periods. Um, predictability just simply does not exist to choose one deterministic solution over another nearly a week in advance. 
Uh, other examples that I've commonly seen, something like uh, small adjustments to dew points four, five, six, seven days in advance, uh, just not an element that we usually have good predictability for. Uh, small adjustments are eliminating pops in the extended based on a single model run, another area where uh, reasonable scientific predictability just doesn't exist. Bottom line here is if that change can't be clearly and convincingly supported by ensemble guidance, conditional climatology, uh, and or pattern recognition, then it's likely not going to qualify as a target of opportunity. John? Thank you, Andy. So, you know, with this in mind, and this is a great discussion by Andy on, on, on targets of opportunity, uh, the question then becomes, how do we leverage technology uh, to help us going forward as we use Forecast Builder and we evolve our operations deeper into an IDSS uh, mind frame? And uh, as, as Andy mentioned and, and clearly outlined, you know, over the years, targets opportunity uh, was nebulously defined. It was tough to put meat on those bones. Uh, it, it's proven quite difficult uh, to, to kind of wrap our heads around. Uh, but with those, uh, with those principles that Andy just laid out in mind, uh, as far as what a target of opportunity really equates to when it comes to uh, what is our DSS message? Uh, do we have a hazard on the horizon? Is there, you know, is there variability that leads to lower confidence uh, in our guidance and in our model solutions? You know, how can we utilize technology to help us focus our attention on the gridded database where it needs most? So, um, you know, while discouraging or eliminating a, a grid editing by one or two units seem to be the best idea, as Andy already talked about, such direction has weaknesses. So, you know, on a, on a clear day at 70 versus 72, sure, yeah, one or two degrees, not that big of a deal. But, you know, one or two degrees becomes a very big deal with critical thresholds, uh, whether or not you're going to be above or below freezing. Does it change your precip type? Does it change those impacts? Uh, does it change your IDSS message? So what we need to do is have a more global definition of, of how to apply targets of opportunity. As a result, the goal is to create a grid management approach that focuses on where hazards are expected, as well as guidance variance, and that's used as a proxy for confidence. As a proxy for confidence, and there's two programs that are that have the potential to help us in the future. The first one is Hazards Builder, and the second one is Model Certainty. So we're just going to take the next couple of slides to talk about a potential approach to uh, helping technology help the human forecaster interact with the database, database the best. So what we've called this is kind of the four quadrants of database, database management. It's a simple two-by-two two diagram that outlines forecaster focus on database uh, intervention. And it's been broken down into three separate areas, days four to seven, two to three, and then the ESTF period. So you see on the screens here that simple two by two matrix, and the color coding that you see with each, within each one of these boxes is a way to bring in the work that's being done or has been done by the DSS uh, Office of the Future team. And uh, in the future, everyone's going to be seeing the trigger chart uh, that, uh, that uh, equates to the different levels of DSS engagement and services that are required for a particular event. So for days four to seven, if you have no hazards identified by Hazards Builder, just leave it alone. And Hazards Builder is a program that takes your local um, criteria for whatever the phenomena is, and uh, it applies it to the, the gridded database in GFE. Uh, so if you're meeting or exceeding a, a threshold, it'll highlight that area where attention is required. So if there's no hazards identified by Hazards Builder, leave it alone. If there are hazards expected, only address the database if it changes the local DSS message. Now, especially for days four to seven, as the national bundle models down the road delivers probabilistic information, it's going to be easier to target areas where database management is necessary. And again, that's where hazards are expected. Right now, as Andy mentioned earlier, you know, GFE is very, very deterministic, and that is a great weakness uh, the further out in time we go. So uh, National Bundle Models is going to help us a great deal as we get to that uh, time frame. So now days two and three, um, taking the same two-by-two two matrix, uh, if there's no hazards and model variance is low, leave it alone. Again, this whole process is meant to draw attention to where the database needs to be reviewed and potentially addressed. If there are hazards expected, then more attention to the database is going to be required. 
If there are hazards and high variability, well, this is basically all hands on deck, requires the highest attention to the database and the DSS message. Uh, finally, we have the ESTF period. And as you can imagine, you know, policy already dictates frequent updates to the database regardless of conditions. So uh, at least every three hours or if conditions are changing rapidly, go ahead and address it. So a two by two diagram really here is, is not necessary. And we must own the short term. This is where the human forecaster can excel the most. So just to kind of wrap up this potential approach, and again, this is something that is, that is under development as we, we, we mature in the forecast builder area and we move forward and we find ways to, to leverage technology to serve the human forecaster so that the human uh, forecaster can serve the customer. Uh, the database management approach aims to level the playing field from office to office when it comes to defining targets of opportunity. Uh, emphasis is placed on the ongoing DSS message, the risk of hazards and predictability, in the form of assessing model variants. You know, edits are not based on perceived accuracy or trying to choose a model winner. Uh, this is based on me DSS messaging and the variability that we have amongst our, our guidance uh, that, that, that's available to us. And again, this approach, again, is still evolving. Your feedback with this is welcome and appreciated. And you're gonna hear more and more about this as things are, as these programs are delivered to you with a three phase rollout in the not too distant future. Andy's going to take a look at going even forward more. Uh, uh, back to you, Andy. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, so wrapping up here, you know, where do we go forward from here? Um, the process that we've laid out in this webinar was jointly developed by the Central Region Consistency Team and the Central Region Grid Team. Uh, and those are teams that are made up primarily of bargaining unit members across the region. Uh, and they include both the Nuisio uh, Regional Chair and uh, myself, who's the uh, Regional Vice Chair. Uh, this process, I, I'm very thankful for, also has the endorsement of our leadership at Central Region Headquarters. Um, and for all the reasons that we've laid out today, uh, these teams really believe very strongly that this process is the best way for us to collectively, as a region, approach the forecast process. Uh, that said, our success is going to hinge on each individual and each office adopting this approach, uh, so I would certainly encourage you uh, to do so. Uh, there are going to be some additional uh, resources that will be available over the coming days and weeks. Uh, we are going to record uh, a version of this webinar and make it available as part of the suite of forecaster builder training. Uh, so for new employees coming to the agency or employees that are coming to Central Region from a different region that isn't using forecast builder, uh, they will have <clears throat> this uh, philosophy laid out for them as part of their forecast builder training. There's also a white paper that has been developed uh, that contains some additional background on this process, uh, and we can certainly make that available shortly uh, for those who wish to read it. And we're also going to be working to develop a one-page reference sheet that contains the eight steps that John laid out, as well as reminders on what does and does not qualify as a target of opportunity. So that's about all we have. Uh, at this point, I will hand things back to Bruce at Central Region Headquarters, and John and I are certainly would welcome uh, any questions that folks might have. Bruce. Great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and John, both of you, great job. I appreciate your efforts on all of this. Uh, just a few comments uh, that I would throw in here uh, as folks are maybe pondering questions they want to ask, and I would certainly encourage everyone to ask some questions here. Uh, you know, as I listen to what Andy and John presented there, I, I don't think a lot of this is necessarily brand new to a lot of folks. These are concepts and topics that I think a lot of offices are struggling with and talking about. This is a great opportunity, though, to, uh, to get us all as close to being on the same page as we possibly can from a philosophical standpoint. And along those lines, uh, I was on a conference call earlier today where this, these types of topics were coming up with WPC. Talked to Greg Carbon and Dave Novak at, at, at WPC talking about how we begin to work these concepts toward a fully, fully integrated field structure, which kind of it points out the fact that this is just an evolutionary process we're in the middle of right now. We're not going to be able to flip a switch and be where we know we might be a couple years from now, but uh, this dialogue is necessary to get us there. And then also, this presentation is just being uh, shared with, with Western Region, where they've got a lot of interest in what we're doing with Forecast Builder here in Central Region. I've talked to uh, Andy Edmond, the, the SSD chief in Western Region, and 
I didn't want them to get it out before we had this opportunity to share it with all of you this week, but he's in the process of sharing this presentation with, uh, with those folks in, uh, in Western Region, starting with the SUS and then going through all the Western Region offices. So the point is, this is uh, this is grab, uh, gaining momentum and, and traction, and, and these concepts are, are going to be talked about a lot more going forward. And lastly, to me, one of the one of the biggest takes, takeaways from from this presentation is uh, it has to do with target of opportunity. And I almost flip it upside down. What I see as one of the biggest struggles here is is the the, the, the forecaster at WFOs recognizing not only what is a target of opportunity when we want to get in and collaborate smart adjustments to a consistent starting point, but developing the discipline to understand when and where we shouldn't be messing with the grids. And I thought uh, Andy and John did a nice job laying that out. So uh, it, it's really a change in how we've operated. Because if you think about it, it wasn't too many years ago we were manually populating everything. And when you'd manually populate it, it sort of instinctively felt like everything was a target of opportunity because you were so involved with the population decision, so everything was sort of a target. But starting with a consistent starting point, uh, it sort of flips it upside down and, and you really have to challenge yourself to recognize when and where you have, uh, have meteorological reason to get in and make significant changes that affect your IDSS message. So just a little different way of approaching this and uh, again, weather service wide, we're working through these concepts right now as we continue to move toward the, the national blend of models. So enough for me. Uh, questions. Uh, I see a question from uh, Todd, Ham uh, Todd Hamilton. And Todd, I've opened up your mic. Okay. It, uh, can you hear us? Yeah, go ahead, Todd. You're, you're live. The, 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 I guess the main question we have is based on the forecast builder process, and some of the changes that have happened there. One of the things that we struggle with a little bit is really what to put in the long-term portion of the AFD now. Do you have any suggestions regarding, you know, some best practices for that? And it seems like it might be a lot shorter now based on, you know, kind of the way we're assembling the, the long-term period of the forecast. Yeah, Andy, John, go ahead. One of you can answer that. Yeah, this is Andy. Um, uh, and certainly, John, feel free to, to weigh in with your thoughts. Uh, definitely something I have I've experienced as well. Um, I know for us, the the AFD uh, is is certainly transitioned a little bit from a, a deeply scientific discussion. Um, there's definitely time and place for that, but uh, one that is a little bit more plain language for uh, our some of our higher end, but still um, non meteorologist uh, users of the product out there. Uh, so for the extended in particular, uh, for me, that really has turned into a, um, uh, a heads up on those potential uh, um, lower probability but higher impact scenarios that might be out there, things that maybe are not within the realm of predictability, i.e., I can't, I can't pick a winner between the GFS and the European right now, but there are indications from, you know, this suite of, of particular uh, suite of model guidance that we might have a high impact event occurring five, six, seven days out. Keep an eye on it. John, any more to add there? No, I think you handled that per perfectly, Andy, and I think you know, that's the evolution that I've personally seen as well uh, with the long-term portion of the AFT. I think you handled that very well. Thank you. Yeah. I agree, and, and and I think just to just to dovetail onto what Andy said, it, it it's it's uncomfortable for forecasters when maybe there's possibilities that aren't really reflected in the grids at all, but you still want to communicate that, and and there's a disconnect there because we would we would traditionally talk in terms of what's in the official forecast, but it's a whole new world now where you're you're talking about those possibilities that may not be explicitly re uh, reflected in the grids. And I, and I just one more comment there uh, for for Todd and and anyone else. I think that you know one one thing to keep in mind from a philosophical perspective is that the AFD does not necessarily need to be a one to one reflection of the gridded database. The the gridded database is part of the office's suite of IDSS messaging. Uh, the AFD is another part of that, and so there may be opportunities to where you can better utilize. Uh, the written word uh, for communicating part of your office's IDSS message versus what could be shown explicitly uh, in the gridded database.
And we have a question now from uh, Denny Van Cleve. You're open. Actually, this is from Steve Hens. But Already. Uh, my question is, can you, go to, can you find slide four to show, or step four in the slides? Might help a little bit. Yeah, just, just a moment here. Not I can go on. OK, step four. Uh, basically, it's for the current time through period two. A I mean, forecaster builder works really well with period three through seven now. Uh, most of the forecasters and surrounding offices uh, using forecast builder, it's run off the con, uh, cron. But that current time through period two is still kind of a, a problem where you have uh, multiple forecasters putting different types of grids in at different times. So if you look at the actual NDFD data or just data on the ISC, uh, it's period period one and two that we have all of the disagreements with. So I was just wondering, when are we going to come with a consistent policy for that current time through period two so we can get the efficiencies of uh, forecast builder into those periods? This is Bruce. I'll, I'll start uh, with a response here, and then Andy and John, you can chime in. But uh, kind of parallel to the activities here, our grid methodology team uh, met just recently, and one of the things that I feel very strongly about is is the quality of our of our near-term grids. And I think there's a lot of work to go on here. You're going to see a, a, a reinvigoration, if you will, of the ESTF initiative later this calendar year, and especially this upcoming winter. Uh, it'd be like we'd like to have it sooner than that, but uh, going into summer with a lot of other things on the plate, the, the, the grid methodology team uh, wanted to tackle that this this winter. Your questions are spot on. I think if you polled individual offices and individual forecasters, you'd get all sorts of answers as to what we're truly looking for in the near-term grids from a grid resolution standpoint to the, the t kind of precision that ought to exist in there and the tools to make that happen. So what I'm hoping we see by next spring is a series of Camtasia videos that would, would lay out you know, six or eight different weather scenarios where you've got uh, you know, impactful weather in the near term and how the forecaster ought to in interact with the database to create those grids. Uh, with respect to consistency and, and, and border consistencies, it becomes a big issue because as time goes to zero in the near term, you know, your weather becomes more, more binary and deterministic. So uh, in, in my world, I don't think we would, we would look at inconsistencies in the first 12 hours as critically as we do for, say, a, a day three or four forecast because the weather just behaves differently in the near term. And I'd like forecasters to have the flexibility to really resolve those things in the near term. So uh, I'm not sure that's, that's answering your question, except to say that, uh, that the near term is decidedly different uh, for obvious reasons than, than sort of our mid and long term forecast challenges with Forecast Builder. Andy, yeah, John? I still think that it, yeah, if, if we had all start at the same consistent starting point like we are in the extended periods, uh, that it, it, I think this, uh, if we just start the same way, even though we may go in slightly different directions, that it's still going to look a whole lot better you know, and easier for collaboration. Yeah, this is this is John. I, I think it's a point well taken, and uh, given the the briefings that uh, those of us on the consistency team have had, uh, and and other discussions with the grid team, uh, yeah, I think the the point is very well taken that a, a unified approach at at a common time is is something that is is beneficial, and it's something that seriously needs to be considered again going forward. And I know in talking with Jerry and Chuck and Andy Just uh, from the grid team, that those very questions are, are being addressed amongst that group. And uh, I do, uh, as, as Bruce said, look forward to see what they are going to deliver to us uh, as we head towards uh, next winter and next calendar year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and the, you know, part of the, the motivation for really reinvigorating the near-term part is, you know, increasingly we're going to be encouraging forecasters to be fiddling with the grids less and less in the medium and, and long range. And then those 0 to 12 or 0 to 18 hour grids uh, will drive will dr drive the short-term forecast information we provide to, to our customers and also digital aviation services. So that's really where our, our emphasis, obviously, is going to be going forward. 
and there's a lot of work still to be done there. Some great questions, and we really do appreciate it. Uh, hopefully there's more. We had a question uh, earlier from uh, uh, Teresa Keck at uh, uh, North uh, Platte. Just uh, we'll be sharing a copy of the presentation and uh, and and a recording of this webinar uh, when we're all done here. So you can look forward to that and share it with uh, others in your office that could participate today. Any other questions? If you do, you can just uh, click next to your uh, your name or office uh, where the little hand is raised, and I can open up your mic. All right, nothing heard. Uh, thanks once again, uh, Andy and John. Fantastic job, great information. I uh, appreciate the questions, and uh, we're all going to get there. This is an evolution, and uh, webinars and sharing information like this is, uh, is the best way to help us all move in the right direction. So thank you all for your participation today.